Chapter 3 of Among the Night People by Clara Dillingham Pearson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 3 The Naughty Raccoon Children. There was hardly a night of his life when the little brother of the raccoon family was not reproved by his mother for teasing. Mrs. Raccoon said she didn't know what she had done to deserve such a child. When she spoke like this to her neighbors, they sighed and said, It must be trying, but he may outgrow it. The oldest wolverine, though, told the skunk that his cousin, Mrs. Raccoon's husband, had been just as bad as that when he was young. I do not want you to say that I said so, he whispered, because he might hear of it and be angry, but it is true. The oldest wolverine didn't say whether Mr. Raccoon outgrew this bad habit, yet it would seem that his wife had never noticed it. You must not think that Mr. Raccoon is dead. Oh, no, indeed. Every night he was prowling through the forest on tiptoe, looking for food. But Mrs. Raccoon was a very devoted mother, and gave so much time and attention to her children that she was not good company for her husband. He did not care much for home life, and the children annoyed him exceedingly, so he went away and found a hole in another tree which he fitted up for himself. There he slept through the day and until the setting of the sun told him that it was time for his breakfast. Raccoons like company, and he often had friends in to sleep with him. Sometimes these friends were raccoons like himself, with wives and children, and then they would talk about their families and tell how they thought their wives were spoiling the children. The four little raccoons who lived with their mother in the dead branch of the big oak tree had been born in April, when the forest was sweet with the scent of wild violets, and everyone was happy. Beautiful pink and white trilliliums raised their three-cornered flowers above their threefold leaves, and nodded with every passing breeze. Yellow adder's tongue was there, with crane's bill geraniums, squirrel corn, and spring beauties, besides hepaticas and windflowers, and the dainty bishop's cap. The young raccoons did not see these things, for their eyes would not work well by daylight, and when, after dark, their mother let them put their heads out of the hole and look around, they were too far from the ground to see the flowers sleeping in the dusk below. They could only sniff, sniff, sniff with their sharp little turned-up noses, and wonder what flowers look like anyway. When their mother was with them for a time, and that was while they were drinking the warm milk that she always carried for them, she told them stories of the flowers and trees. She had begun by telling them animal stories, but she found that it made them cowardly. Just supposing, one young raccoon had said, a great big dreadful snail should come up this tree and eat us all. The mother told them that snails were small and slow and weak and never climbed trees or ate people, but it did no good, and her children were always afraid of snails until they had seen one for themselves. After that, she told them stories of the flowers, and when they asked if the flowers would ever come to see them, she said, No, indeed, you will never see them until you can climb down the tree and walk among them, for they grow with their feet in the ground and never go anywhere. There were many stories which they wanted over and over again, but the one they liked best of all was that about the wicked, wicked poison ivy and the gentle, spotted touch-me-not who grew near him and undid all the trouble that Ivy made. When the night came for the young raccoons to climb down from their tree and learn to hunt, all the early spring blossoms were gone, and only the ripening seed vessels showed where nodding flowers had been. You would have expected the raccoon children to be disappointed, yet there were so many other things to see and learn about that it was not until three nights later that they thought much of the flowers. They might not have done so if little sister had not lost her hold upon the oak tree bark and had fallen with her forepaws on a scarlet jack-in-the-pulpit berry. They had to learn to climb quickly and strongly up all sorts of trees. Perhaps Mrs. Raccoon had chosen an oak for her nest because that was rough and easily climbed. There were many good places for raccoons to grip with their twenty strong claws apiece. After they had learned oaks, they took maples, ironwoods, and beeches, each a harder lesson than the one before. When you climb a tree, said their mother, 
always look over the trunk and the largest branches for hiding places, whether you want to use them or not. Why? asked three of the four children. Big Brother, who was rather vain, was looking at the five beautiful black rings and the beautiful black tip of his wonderfully bushy tail. Between the black rings were whitish ones, and he thought such things much more interesting than holes in trees. Because, said the mother raccoon, you may be far from home some night and want a safe place to sleep in all day. Or if a man and his dogs are chasing you, you must climb into the first hiding place you can. We raccoons are too fat and slow to run away from them, and the rings on our tails and black patches on our broad faces might show from the ground. If the hole is a small one, make it cover your head and your tail anyway, and as much of your brown body fur as you can. Mother Raccoon looked sternly at Big Brother because he had not been listening, and he gave a slight jump and asked, oh, What did you say? What did I say? she replied. You should have paid better attention. Yes, am said Big Brother, who was now very meek. I shall not repeat it said his mother. But I will tell you not to grow vain of your fur. It is very handsome, and so is that of your sisters and your brother. So is mine, and so was your father's the last time I saw him. Yet nearly all the trouble that raccoons have is on account of their fur. Never try to show it off. The time came for the young raccoons to stop drinking milk from their mother's body and when they tried to do so, she only walked away from them. "'I cannot work so hard to care for you,' said she. "'I am so tired and thin now that my skin is loose, and you must find your own food. You are getting forty fine teeth apiece, and I never saw a better lot of claws on any raccoon family, if I do say it.' They used to go hunting together, for it is the custom of raccoons to go in parties of from five to eight, hunt all night, and then hide somewhere until the next night. They did not always come home at sunrise, and it made a pleasant change to sleep in different trees. One day they all cuddled down in the hollow of an old maple, just below where the branches came out. Mother Raccoon had climbed the tree first, and was curled away in the very bottom of the hole. The four children were not tired, and hadn't wanted to go to bed at all. Little Sister made a dreadful face when her mother called her up the tree and if it had not already been growing light, Mrs. Raccoon would probably have seen it and punished her. Big Sister curled down beside her mother, and Little Sister was rather above them and beside mischievous Little Brother. Last of all came Big Brother, who had stopped to scratch his ear with his hind foot. He was very proud of his little round ears, and often scratched them in this way to make sure that the fur lay straight on them. He was so slow in reaching the hole that before he got into it, a robin had begun his morning song of cheerly, cheerly, chirp, and a chipmunk perched on a stump to make his morning toilet. He got all settled, and little brother was half asleep beside him, when he remembered his tail, and sat up to have one more look at it. Little brother growled sleepily, and told him to let his old tail along and come to bed, as long as they couldn't hunt any more. But Big Brother thought he saw a sand burr on his tail, and wanted to pull it out before it hurt the fur. Then he began to look at the bare, tough pads on his feet, and to notice how finely he could spread his toes. Those of his front feet he could spread especially wide. He balanced himself on the edge of the hole, and held them spread out before him. It was still dark enough for him to see well. "'Come here, little brother,' he cried. "'Wake up, and see how big my feet are getting.' Mother Raccoon growled at them to be good children and go to sleep, but her voice sounded dreamy and far away, because she had to talk through part of her own fur and most of her daughter's. Little Brother lost his patience, unrolled himself with a spring, jumped to the opening, and knocked his brother down. It was dreadful. Of course, Big Brother was not much hurt, for he was very fat, and his fur was both long and thick, but he turned over and over on his way to the ground before he alighted on his feet. He turned so fast, and Little Brother's eyes hurt him so, that it looked as though Big Brother had about three heads, three tails, and twelve feet. He called out as he fell, and that awakened the sisters, who began to cry, and Mother Raccoon, who was so scared that she began to scold. 
Such a time! Mother Raccoon found out what had happened, and then she said to Little Brother, Did you mean to push him down? No, ma'am, answered Little Brother, hanging his head. Anyhow, I didn't mean to after I saw him going. Perhaps I did mean to do it before that. You see, he was a truthful raccoon, even when he was most naughty. And there is always hope for a raccoon who will tell the truth, no matter how hard it is to do so. Big Brother climbed slowly up the trunk of the oak tree, while more and more of the daytime people came to look at him. He could not see well now, and so was very awkward. When he reached the hole, he was hot and cross, and complained to his mother. "'Make him quit teasing me,' he said, pointing one forepaw at little brother. "'I will,' answered Mother Raccoon. "'But you were just as much to blame as he, for if you had cuddled down quietly when I told you to, you would have been dreaming long ago. Now you must sleep where I was, at the lower end of the hole.' Little brother must go next, and I do not want to hear one word from either of you. Sisters next, and I will sleep by the opening. You children must remember that it is no time for talking to each other, or looking at claws, or getting sand burrs out of your tail after you have been sent to bed. Go to sleep, and don't awaken until the sun has gone down, and you are ready to be my good little raccoons again. Her children were asleep long before she was, and she talked softly to herself after they were dreaming. They do not mean to be naughty, she said. Yet it makes my fur stand on end to think what might have happened. I ought not to have curled up for the day until they had done so. Mothers should always be at the top of the heap. Then she fixed herself for a long, restful day's sleep. End of chapter 3